Good morning. Hi, my name is Barry Taylor from Equip for Quality. Welcome to all of you who are here at Equip for Quality for our meeting and those of you who are watching on the webcast and those of you who will be watching on CAN TV. Um, this is a meeting we have every month called the Disability Rights Consortium where uh, we get folks together who care about disability rights issues to talk about issues of common concern. And today I'm, I'm very excited uh, about our presentation. Um, we're doing something a little different rather than focusing on a, a current legal issue. Um, we're going to actually step back and think a little bit about the broader perspective of the disability rights, civil rights movement and uh, the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is going to be celebrating its 24th anniversary in July. And uh, I can't think of a better person actually on the planet to, uh, to lead this discussion. Uh, somebody that many of you know already, Marco Bristow, who's the president and CEO at Access Living, uh, the former chairperson for the National Council on Disability, and, and many, many other things. Uh, Marco has really been a true leader in the disability rights movement, not only here in Chicago and Illinois, but nationally and actually internationally as well. And uh, she's somebody who I've grown to, to know and become a friend and is a personal hero of mine. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Marco. Wow. Thanks, Barry. That was really uh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, you know, the work that we do in the disability rights field is done by everyday people, and the, the honor that I have to work with such great people as Barry is one of the reasons that I love this work and what lifts me up and keeps me going. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, Barry asked me to talk about the history of the disability rights movement you know, kind of a big order, right? <laughs> um, and in order to think about the best way to approach this, um, I really decided I was going to approach this from a national perspective. Um, when I was growing up as a young activist, uh, the Speaker of the House was a guy named Tip O'Neill. And Tip O'Neill always used to be known for saying, all politics are local. And I totally recognize that. I also believe that all politics are personal. And so I want to give some recognition to the local because locally we have been a very vital part of the national and international disability rights movement. But most of my comments will be framed through my personal lens, meaning the seat that I had and the worldview that I achieved from where I was uh, participating at that time. Therefore, um, if you were to speak to any number of equally wonderful disability rights leaders, you'll hear the same stories but through a slightly different lens. And I would encourage you to do that. There's uh, lots of online tools where a lot of these stories are being archived. Um, and I think it's really great to see that tapestry when it's all laid out side by side. Um, on the local level, uh, just to mark a few of those things, um, We've had some great victories here from recently, the big Olmstead class action lawsuits that are beginning to get people with disabilities out of institutions. Um, ADAPT locally uh, brought the first lawsuit along uh, with Access Living to get lifts on buses under an Illinois law back in the 1980s before the ADA existed. Um, also in the early 80s, there was, some of you are too young to remember this, but there was a poisoning of Tylenol bottles locally, and there was a big Tylenol scare that was all over the city. And my staff came to me back then, my deaf staff, and said, what's happening? A week after the event, they realized that there had been a crisis because there had been no captioning on television when there was emergencies. Uh, that led to early captioning for emergency circumstances. Um, we were one of the first states to advocate for uh, a TTY system in the state. Um, and and um, there's individual activists here locally who have uh, made great gains. I'm thinking of one young man by the name of Kelly Pierce who um, got the banks in Chicago to start making their ATMs accessible. Um, one of the very first in the whole country. So we have some really great people uh, here in Chicago, and I, I would be remiss in not acknowledging uh, the heroes on, upon whose shoulders my journey began. Um, people a little bit unorthodox at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, a medical institution of all things, the, um, and you'll hear a little bit more about this as I speak about my own story. 
Dr. Henry Betts, um, who was the CEO of the Rehab Institute, really saw um, his mission beyond the walls of his hospital, well beyond, uh, well before any other physician did, understanding that all the world-class rehabilitation in the world goes nowhere if people re-enter the world and face all the barriers that we did back in 1977 when I broke my neck. So having acknowledged a lot of that uh, early work, I'd like to maybe take you a little personal. Um, in, I was a registered nurse, um, had traveled around the world um, as an exchange student when I was in high school, uh, really out in the world, a student of the civil rights movement. I was born in 1953. Um, I had an older brother that had um, gone to Fisk University during the heyday of the civil rights movement um, on an a exchange program who was caught up in a lot of the uh, sniping violence that occurred when uh, Stokely Carmichael was there. Uh, my brother was also uh, uh, gay before there was a term for it <laughs> and uh, was at the very early Stonewall uh, uh, demonstrations and actions in New York City. Uh, I went to a small college in Wisconsin before I was disabled where the women's movement was starting to take hold um, my, I uh, was a TA, or I worked for uh, the head of the sociology department who was developing the first women's studies program at the time, so I was asked to help her uh, identify what books to bring in and, you know, got very excited by Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan and uh, Simone de Beauvoir and all the other incredible women's rights leaders of the day. So I, like many of my peers, who I didn't know yet, of course, were raised in the anti-war and civil rights, women's rights, uh, Ralph Nader consumerism, uh, question authority period of the of the 60s and 70s. Um, that frames a little bit about where I came from. In 1977, I was out with some friends. Um, I was a labor and delivery nurse at the time. My friend's uh, dog knocked my shoes into Lake Michigan off of Pratt Street Beach and I dived in to retrieve the shoes, not knowing that it was not very deep. And kind of like that, my world changed. I broke my neck at the C78 level, was whisked off to Northwestern eventually, um, went through the whole uh, rehabilita rehabilitation process, ended up at the Rehab Institute, and early on kind of thought my life was over. Um, my reaction to it was not uh, depression, which many people do experience, but anger. Um, I was really ticked off at everybody, and I couldn't frame it. I just, all I could, I just knew inside that things didn't seem fair. But I didn't have terminology for it. Um, eventually, I went back out into the world and um, uh, was home one day and the director of nursing at Prentice Woman's Hospital, who I'd never met but where I was working, uh, called me um, uh, and said, how would you like to come back to work? And I should say that I'd lost my job. I'd lost my home. My home had seven stairs. Um, I was a bus rider, didn't know how to drive a car, so I had no way to get around. There was no public transit. Um, I didn't have any income. I lost my health insurance. Um, I was, you know, not sure how my bills were going to get paid for. Um, and when I went out into the world, uh, I experienced what most people at that time did. Uh, people making fun of you, uh, people ignoring you. I remember going into a bar with some friends and um, the bar owner saying to my friends, you and you can stay, but you've got to go. And I said, what? He said, I don't have enough insurance to cover you. And threw me out of the bar uh, before we'd ever ordered. A little side here, there was a cop outside and I was really up, really angry and crying. And the policeman came over and said, what's wrong? And I told him and he walked me right back in the bar and said, what would you like? And, <laughs> or, and I said, a, a glass of wine. He said, give her a bottle of wine. <laughs> So we stayed. Uh, um, in, any, in any case, that was for me what it was like. Um, the, if you went out into the city during this period to go out to dinner, 
um, most often you would go through the kitchen because the front entrances were not accessible. Um, when I went to museums, um, I can tell you the planetarium, the only way to get into the planetarium at the time was an exterior elevator that uh, was the garbage elevator. And um, I rode that garbage elevator one time in the dark because the light went out. And when the doors opened, I'd heard this little rustling. There was a big old rat in that garbage elevator. So suffice it to say, <laughs> it wasn't very disability friendly. Um, during this period, the people at the Rehab Institute started asking me to, um, to come to a committee that they were organizing called an Independent Living Committee. And I wouldn't go. Uh, the nurses at RIC um, kept inviting me to come. And I kept saying no. Um, back to the day that uh, Judy uh, called me, the director of nursing at Northwestern, she called and asked me if I wanted to come back to work. Now this happened, ha probably had to have been about five months after I broke my neck. I was back home. Uh, my world had shrunk. Um, I was lonely. And the words that came out of my mouth for this advocate, for this feisty woman, still shocked me. When she said that to me, I said, I can't work. Um, in five months, I had done what sociologists would call internalizing oppression. I had already begun to redefine who I was and didn't even know I was doing it. Um, but she said, come on in and talk. And I now always think of her as my guardian angel. She, uh, she gave me the opportunity that even to this day so many disabled people don't get the opportunity to go back out into the world and work. Um, I went back to work as a nurse in the clinic. I did not love my job. I was under challenged, but it was a job. And I was, you know, I had to figure out how to get to work and it, it, it paid my bills. Um, and one day I took all my patients' charts that had disabilities, um, not knowing why I had kept all their names on my desk uh, calendar. And I had 26 of them by that time, and sat down and read all their charts back to back in one couple of hour session. And what, when I closed those charts, I was a changed person. Um, chart after chart, they were blank. All the questions on sex. Have you been sexually active? Have you ever had a sexually transmitted disease? Have you ever been pregnant? Um, have you ever had an abortion? Blank, 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 blank. This was a family planning sexual health clinic. They weren't coming there to get, um, you know, their e ENT exam. They were there for women's health issues. Um, and then I flash back on the women that we sent home early because their Medivan came and we hadn't had anybody to get them onto the inaccessible exam table. I remembered this woman, I'll never forget this woman who had significant cerebral palsy. She couldn't speak and she she communicated with the Ouija board. She pointed out the letters and she was almost 70. Why she was referred to me, you know, shows you the prejudice right there. I was there for mostly birth control counseling and I here I had this 70 year old woman who was coming in for a post-op check. Um, and she started to cry, and I said, what's wrong? And she diligently pointed out, I didn't want the surgery. She'd had a bilateral mastectomy against her will, and I said, why? And she said, no one would listen. And um, that changed me. All of a sudden, that stuff that had been personal became not personal anymore. And like you'll hear so much, I wasn't I wasn't quite able to stick up for myself until I saw the injustice to others. And then I realized, me too, this could have been me. And then it became personal um, and political. And so um, I took the charts to my director. Um, she looked at them and said, "This." I went in to quit. That was my plan. Um, and instead she said, will you help me fix this? And I stayed. She sent me to a conference in California, in Berkeley, on sex and disability. And that's where I discovered I had rights. That's where I got a civil rights framework. 
believe it or not, it was in the appendix of a little handbook on birth control. There was something in the appendix called Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. The minute I saw that, for, and I'm sure most of you know what that is, it was the precursor to the ADA that said, uh, if you receive federal funds uh, or you're the federal government, you can't discriminate on the basis of disability. And all of a sudden, I had a new paradigm through which to see my experience. The paradigm I'd been raised in, the paradigm that my brother had fought for, that the civil rights movement, that Gloria Steinem, et cetera, had fought for. And no longer did I see this stuff as attitudinal barriers. I saw it as what it was, discrimination. And then I also realized there was something I could do about it, like those curbs that kept me from getting to the grocery store even though the grocery store was only a, a half a block from my house, um, could be removed. They were man-made. All I needed was a jackhammer, <laughs> right, and some friends. Um, so when I came back on that, I remember flying back. I stayed up all night talking with this woman who's since become a very dear friend of mine and who just led the efforts in New York City to get 50% of the butt of the cabs in New York City made accessible over the next four years. So these friendships, you know, this is a 36-year friendship, and she's still out there doing what she was doing back then in Berkeley. But what she did for me was she was on the program of this conference. We sat up all night talking about sex. Um, it was one of the first times that I really had a chance to talk candidly about my feelings about this stuff. But also, I asked her, how come everything's different out here? How come um, there's curb cuts everywhere? There were only about six in downtown Chicago. How come people aren't staring at me in the restaurants? And she told me a story. She said, there's a group of ad advocates at the campus of UC Berkeley. Um, they work to make the campus accessible, and then later they took it out into the community. So when I flew back, I remembered Wow, not only did I see the world through a different lens, a new paradigm, I found my place in that world, that I had a responsibility to get involved. And so when I returned and that phone rang again from those nurses saying, won't you come to this committee, I went, finally. It was probably eight months of them calling me, and I finally went. Long story short, what happened at that point was they were going to build a transitional living facility at the Lawson Y. They had the plans. They were almost ready to go. And very timidly, I raised my hand and said I wouldn't want to live there. And they said, why? To their credit, they listened. And there were other disabled people in the room, um, although it was mostly medical professionals. And I said, well, my problem wasn't learning how to mop the floor. My problem was um, having a home that was inaccessible. And I think you're just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Where are people going to move after you've done, done teaching them how to mop the floor? So they folded up the plans right then, that moment, and said maybe we should start over. And when they did, um, this wonderful woman named Helen Goodkin um, started looking around the country at what else was happening. And lo and behold, we found this pockets of activism, just like the Berkeley model. But we discovered a guy named Ed Roberts at the campus of Berkeley. Uh, we discovered a guy named Fred Fay um, in Boston uh, working from his bed. Um, Fred had a, something called a syringeal myelial, which meant uh, he had a water-filled cyst in his spine. If he sat up, it would cut out his breathing centers. So he spent 24-7 laying down. And they found a guy named Lex Frieden in Texas who was starting a transitional living model in Texas. And they found a guy named Gerben DeYoung in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who was starting to write about this new concept of consumer-directed independent living. And all this came together for the Chicago network to throw away the original plan and develop what ultimately became Access Living, the first center for independent living in Illinois and one of the first 10 in the U.S. So now I need to divert because that's that was how I got into this. But while I was going through my early, um, probably during the same months that I was breaking my neck, uh, 
those activists from uh, Washington and California were taking over a federal building in Berkeley, California, and having sit-ins on the lawn of Secretary Joseph Califano at, from HEWY. Well, they had been part of a small effort to get the Rehabilitation Act modified to add Section 504. In that same phase, interestingly, the same people had added a model concept to the Rehab Act called Title VII for the establishment of the early template of the independent living program, of which Access Living is one. Um, but those activists, the, the law had been written in 1973, and here it was 1977, and the regulations weren't still out. Now, mind you, I'm in the hospital while this is all happening, so I don't know anything about this, but um, they took over the federal building. It was the, still, to this day, the largest take, longest takeover of a federal building ever in American history. Uh, they were supported by the Black Panthers. They were supported by the labor movement who brought them meals and food changes and interpreters were uh, shuttled into the building. Um, and these folks um, pushed to get those regulations out. They got out. They got out and it was a moment of great celebration for the disability community. Fast forward, we're now in 1980 uh, there or so. There's now the evolution of new centers for independent living popping up. Um, at about the same time, there was an association in DC called the Association of Citizens with Disabilities, ACCD. It was all the disability-led entities like the National Association of the Deaf, the National Federation of the Blind. And the reason I bring this up is um, for most of history, if we had groups that were working on advocacy, they were all in their own place, deaf working on deaf, blind working on blind, and sometimes fighting with each other because one would get more than the other. It really wasn't until the ILCs came forward uh, because of the vision of Ed Roberts and Lex and these other folks who understood that we had more in common than different, that we could fight over the same little piece of the pie or we could fight to get more pie, right? And they brought the concept of cross-disability uh, forward in a more operational way. It had been tried though through ACCD, through this coalition effort, but uh, issues of funding, um, and, and who's getting funded and who isn't and competition and projects taking them off on tangents caused it to kind of dissipate. But it's important to acknowledge those early efforts. Um, they are the precursors of, of what, uh, what we have today and you can still see elements of the remnants of that era through another entity which today um, still exists called the Consortium of Citizens with Disabilities, um, which is, operates completely differently than the old version did, but it's still alive and well in Washington and played an important part in the ADA's passage. So from 80 to 84, five, um, we started to see many more CILs uh, developing. Many of them, however, were taking weird paths and the path that, that they were taking were uh, because there were flaws in the original legislation that uh, required us to be consumer directed um, and we thought that meant run by disabled people. <laughs> but in many states, the state VR agency were actually running the centers. They just had a different shingle on the door that said the independent living unit. And so, um, those of us that were now operating bona fide programs like the Berkeley Center um, banded together and formed something called the National Council on Independent Living. It was founded here in Chicago in 1982. Uh, it now has some 800 members. At the time, it didn't. It was just, you know, 10 of us. But we went to war over getting that language strengthened. Uh, it took us seven or eight years and two different amendments to the act to get it, we, we changed it from consumer involvement to consumer control, thinking that would do it. Uh-uh, it still didn't do it. So we finally went back and um, advocated for 51% of the board, 51% of the management, and 51% of the staff. Uh, 
So we're one of the only entities that has that level of affirmative action built into the statute itself. Um, and it wasn't easy to get done. Um, a little tangent, when we were doing this advocacy, um, the president of our association was from St. Louis, and he had his funding withdrawn right in the middle of this. And those were fighting words. When our leaders' funding got uh, messed with, we really got strong during that period, and that's what uh, lifted us into the national advocacy role. Um, in 1980, probably, when was Reagan elected? Mm -hmm. So in that period, there was this huge effort to um, cut the budget, and there was a huge effort to um, deregulate things. President um, Reagan appointed Vice President Bush to head up something called the Bush Deregulatory Task Force. Um, at the same time, the federal government had just given a grant to DREDF, the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, at the time, pretty much the only disability rights legal entity. The PNA started when? On, on DD issues in 70, but not, yeah. we didn't have all folks until 1990. Yeah, so th there were PNAs, but they were small, they had a narrow scope, and many of them were in government instead of out of government. Um, that's another story. I worked with Zena. I went on the Guardianship and Advocacy Commission where P Equip was early on to get it out of state government. And I worked with Zena as a commission member to push the state to get Equip for Equality out of state government. That was something um, we share. So um, DREDF got this training grant to teach people about Section 504, right? We had these new rights. So DREDF came to Chicago to do a training. We had just hired activist Susan Nussbaum to be our training PR person. And while they were in Chicago, we get the word that the first, one of the first laws that they're going to deregulate, guess what? Section 504. Well, folks had fought like crazy for that, and we were not going to let that go. So here's Dredoff in a hotel down at the McCormick Place with all of us, and we quickly kicked into gear, which was to organize a campaign to stop the deregulation of 504. It was the first time our Centers for Independent Living were called into action. Uh, we were joined by other organizations who were out there, and we organized, I'm told, the largest letter writing campaign that the White House had ever received. Um, what's so interesting, and you'll, I said all politics are personal, um, the vice president had his legal advisor, uh, whose name was Boyden Gray, remember that name. Boyden later became President Bush when he took office uh, legal counsel. So Boyden was bridge partner with a good friend of ours who ran a, play, a disability group in D.C. called the Disability Rights Center. And, the dis and he was best friends with the executive director of DREDF. So here we have this little thing going on where we had bipartisanship, DREDF and the guy from Washington, Evan Kemp, who was a Republican, knew the, the bridge partner of blah, blah, blah. So right after we were victorious, um, Vice President uh, Evan and Boyden organized President, then Vice President Bush to come to the National Council on Independent Living's meeting. I had just been elected president, um, and we had our first opportunity to sit down in a small setting with the Vice President and really talk to him about disability, discrimination, and why this had been so important. That was hi historically significant because we had begun the process of educating the president who would later be the president to sign the ADA. Um, around 1984 or so, another big uh, event occurred. There, um, some of you lawyers in the room will remember Grove City versus Bell which is a, a Supreme Court decision that came down that said, that narrowed the application of the civil rights laws to only programs or activities rather than the entire institution. And this was an enormous blow to the civil rights movement. So rather than the entire university coming under the scope of these non-discrimination laws, only the athletic department might. 
So the civil rights community decided this, we can't do this, and organized an effort to um, develop something called the Civil Rights Restoration Act. It was the first time that the civil rights movement and the disability rights movement came together to work on the Hill on an important piece of legislation, and we were really victorious. It laid the groundwork for the next important piece of legislation called the Fair Housing Amendments Act, which came out in 1988. The civil rights movement had been trying to amend that law for years um, to strengthen some of the enforcement provisions, but had been unsuccessful. And because of the relationships that had been developed, uh, largely through the leaders of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, a guy by the name of Ralph Neese, and DREDF, the Disability Rights Education Fund, a woman by the name of Pat Wright, um, and the, the grassroots groups that had worked together on this, the Civil Rights Movement came to the disability community and said, will you come on board the Fair Housing Act? If we can get your help, we'll, we'll be willing to open up the act further than we were to add you as a protected class. And, and I think you all know that civil rights, people don't like to open civil rights laws ever for fear that they get weakened. So this was a big deal. I was president of our association, Nickel, at the time, and had been asked to testify. Well, it was my first time to testify to Congress, and I was terrified. I didn't know how to do this, and my friends in D.C., the CCD groups, said, we'll help you with the testimony. And I said, great. So they wrote my first draft, and I looked at it, and I said, well, I'm okay with all of it except for one thing. How come there's nothing in here that says building housing inaccessibly is discriminatory? And they said, oh, that's taken care of under the, uh, a different law. It's an architectural issue. And I said, no. When an architect sits down to design things and they don't think of me, that lack of thought is discrimination itself. They said, we'll never get that through, no. And I said, okay, because they knew better than me. So I went in and delivered testimony, and it wasn't in there. And they loved my testimony. I got a lot of applause for it. And then shortly thereafter, um, my National Association had its big meeting in Washington, D.C., and during which there was maybe four, five, 400 people in the room, and I give my president's report in the business meeting. And in the president's report, I talked about my testimony, and one of my members, Charlie Carr, raised his hand and said, how come there's nothing in the bill about building things? That, and I told him, well, we'd never get this through. Somebody puts a motion on the floor and that says, I, I move that uh, Nickel take its name off the bill. And I'm, I'm running the meeting, right? I'm like, oh my God, you know? A second came to the motion. We had a little discussion. They voted to remove Nickel from the bill. This was one of the greatest leadership moments for me, you know, to realize that, you know, if you're leading, you can't get too far ahead of your troops or you're just taking a walk, you know? And it, it really, humbled me, but strengthened me, too. I came out of the room, and my good friend, Pat Wright, um, at the time, she's a tough cookie, and we're really good friends now, but at the time, I was very intimidated by Pat. And she came out, and she said, you can't do that. You can't. I said, we've already done it, Pat. She was really angry at me. I went back to my hotel room a couple of hours later, and then my voicemail was flashing. And it was the staff person to the uh, committee that was handling the bill. And his name was Jeff, and he said, what do we have to do to get Nickel back on the bill? And I told him, we have to change it to add this to the bill. Um, you, some may know that the fair housing protections are not as clear and, or strong as the ADA requirements are. It's part and parcel because it happened so quick. There really wasn't enough time to really be as thoughtful as we would later be. But while I was at it, um, I don't share this too often, I'm also a recovering alcoholic. I had just gotten sober, and when I looked at the definition of disability, there was nothing in there at all that made it clear that people who, had, uh, who were in recovery would be covered. So we also talked that through, and there was language in the Fair Housing Act that made it clear that if a person was in recovery, 
um, and not using illegal drugs, um, uh, that we would have protections under the Fair Housing Act. So those are little tidbits of history that probably not a lot of people remember, except those of us that were there. And I feel very uh, grateful to have had that chance to work on that. Okay, so now we're done with the Fair Housing Act. And um, enter on the scene uh, two important entities, the National Council on Disability, a relatively new organization that also was in the Rehab Act, um, appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate. At the time, uh, Republican uh, members appointed to it. We're now in eight, 1985. Um, uh, the chairman of this was a woman named Sandra Perino. She was a Republican who had a disabled son. The vice chair was a newly emerging wealthy Republican from Texas by the name of Justin Dart. Justin Dart was the son of Justin Dart Sr., who was the on the kitchen cabinet, the finance chair for Ronald Reagan. So a pretty conservative um, industrialist, very, very wealthy man. Uh, Justin, however, had grown up in the same civil rights movement, organized a chapter of the NAACP on his college campus, and he and his dad had a falling out over their politics. Um, eventually, Justin was sent by his family to Japan to start Tupperware, um, one of their companies. And while in Japan, he met and fell in love with uh, a woman named Yoshiko Dart, and they uh, ultimately got married. And um, Justin was one day, um, you know, he was this wealthy guy, post-polio, used a wheelchair. Um, he would go to all these civic events where he, charity events, you know, and give out money and get his picture taken. And he was invited to go to a rehabilitation center in Vietnam. Um, this probably would have been in like 19, 75, 80, somewhere in there. So he went, and um, I remember the first time he told me this story. Um, he was with this group, and they all had their cameras and were taking these pictures of this wealthy, uh, charitable civic leader. And he went to this rehabilitation center, which he described as nothing more than a hut with a dirt floor with disabled children lying on the ground with a few people there um, to oversee them. No rehabilitation happening. And this little girl, um, little Vietnamese girl, reached up to Justin and he said, I realized in that moment that she was looking to me to save her. And I realized I couldn't and what a fraud I was. And he um, re left the business immediately. He and his wife retreated to a cabin on the side of a mountain. No heat, no electricity, no power for three years where he contemplated this life crisis. And all of this was happening disconnected to everything that was happening in the disability movement. Um, uh, he did, while he was there, start the sports movement in Japan. Many years later, I would travel to Japan and meet one of the young men that he gave his, gave his life back to through this sports activity. And um, a little diversion here, Justin always wanted to climb Mount Fuji and um, made it halfway up and then got a shoulder injury. And this young man later, when Justin was very sick towards the end of his life, uh, I went back to visit Japan a second time and I met him a second time, he's an artist, um, and he told me, I want you to take this message back to Justin. He said, I finished our climb. I did that for Justin. So, I mean, there's so many little gems. I wish I could talk forever, but I'm running out of time. So, um, Justin um, came down from the mountain, went back to Texas where he was from, learned about this thing called the Austin Resource Center for Independent Living and they learned about him and they put him on his board and he started prolifically writing these esoteric essays about independent living. And Lex Frieden, the guy that had started that trans, called me up one day and said, I'm doing this conference on independent living. You're one of the leaders, please come. You're gonna meet this guy, Justin. He's going places. 
And so Justin was a late comer to our movement, but he became our spiritual leader. Um, anybody who knew him when he was alive, he represented the best of our movement. He had such vision, such eloquence, uh, and more than anything, he, could, he was a bridge builder. He could bring people together. And, and he did so pretty much because he loved us so much. And um, he became the vice chair of the National Council on Disability. NCD was charged with giving a policy report to Congress every year. Um, and its first report was issued in 1986. It was called Towards Independence. And they did an analysis of American uh, policy from a disability perspective across many areas of public policy, transit, housing, employment, education, et cetera. And they found that the common thread that ran through all of those issues was the issue of discrimination. And, and whereas we had certain laws, uh, the Air Carrier Access Act, the Fair Housing Act, and some, uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, then it was called 94-142. Um, uh, there, there wasn't something that brought it all together and applied it to the states, applied it to private industry, et cetera. And therefore, the National Council began the process to determine what would be the remedy for that. Um, I do want to acknowledge that in the 1970s, because there were so many disabled children categorically kept out of school, the parents' movement of kids with disabilities preceded a lot of what I was saying. Their law was passed in 1975. It occurred because in state after state, people were challenging their state constitutions or state laws. Um, because kids were being just told they couldn't go to school. And after enough of those different lawsuits percolated up, the federal government, with parents pushing, uh, adopted what is now IDEA. Um, so Justin and Sandy and the others at NCD uh, began a process of consultation with the community. Um, um, I was fortunate to be in what I think is the, the pivotal meeting at NCD, where uh, about eight of us were invited in to talk about whether we should amend the Civil Rights Act or create our own. And I was in the minority. I felt we should amend the Civil Rights Act because what's a higher act of discrimination than having been left out of the law that says you can't discriminate? Um, however, I was um, outnumbered, but also I, my colleagues convinced me that we needed two pillars. We needed the ADA, I'm sorry, we needed the Civil Rights Act in its broad and sweeping principled approach. But we also needed some of the concepts that were in Section 504, um, reasonable accommodation, undue burden, because we were asking people to do more than change their behavior. We had to change the built environment, the communication systems. And that, that caught, required more than cease and desist in the way you were behaving. It required proaction. So we decided to go with uh, uh, the ADA. The original ADA uh, was drafted by NCD. Uh, I first saw it on a pad of paper like this that Bob Bergdorf had sketched out in a hotel room at a nickel conference. And um, we loved it. It later be called, became um, nicknamed the Flatten the Earth Bill because it went so far, it would have required everybody to immediately become 100% accessible overnight. It also included health care. Um, um, and uh, the first bill that was introduced in 1988, yes, I think 88, um, didn't go anywhere. So at that time, the ball was kind of passed from NCD, which had drafted the first bill to the community and to the Senate and the House. And a process began to craft the new bill. A word is, uh, an important word needs to be said about the members of Congress and our efforts to um, uh, engage them. We could not have done this without the due diligence of the disability community to find the members of Congress who had been touched by disability. 
and the two people who stepped forward early on were uh, Congressman Tony Quello from California and Senator Lowell Weicker from Connecticut. Uh, Tony uh, had epilepsy and uh, Lowell had a son with uh, Down syndrome, um, a child. I'm not sure if it's a son or a daughter now that I say that. Um, so we went to them and said, will you carry this bill? Um, they immediately said yes. Uh, when we came through the second version, Weicker came to us and said, um, I can carry the bill with, ha with insurance in it. Uh, in other words, that the provisions would apply to the insurance industry as well. But if I do, you're going to have the fight of your life and because the insurance lobby is so strong, it will likely kill the whole bill. So you have a decision to make. Do you want it in? or are you willing to let that go? I give you my word that once we pass this bill, I'll come back the next year and we'll take on insurance by itself. Well, Weicker lost the election. So we never had the opportunity until the Affordable Care Act to go back and get rid of the pre-existing uh, condition exclusions that were um, keeping so many people with disabilities out of work and away from the health insurance that they deserved. Um, the process of getting the bill done was remarkable. Um, keep in mind we didn't have fax machines yet, we didn't have email, we had telephones, we had letters. So Justin took his life savings, of which were numerable, and he and his wife set about visiting all 50 states three times to organize people with disabilities. Three times they went to all 50 states and had little meetings like this. Ours was at Access Living. Um, uh, there were an immense number of these activities going and he called upon us to write our discrimination diaries. Either an hour in your life, a day, a week, a month, whatever. Put it on paper and send it to him. Um, he uh, delivered that, those diaries in three big garbage bags to the Senate when he testified. And it, there wasn't a dry eye in the House. Um, also, um, Senator, I'm sorry, Congressman Quello uh, went and testified uh, before the Senate and told his story there. I can remember being at a nickel meeting when um, we need, it, there was a filibuster going on. It was the middle of the night. And Pat Wright called me up and said, I need the troops. I said, Pat, it's the middle of the night. She says, I don't care. I need the troops. So we went around to people's bedroom doors and got folks, and a lot of them, their PAs had left already. So people were in their pajamas. And over we go to the Capitol Hill, middle of the night, and packed the room where Orrin Hatch was filibustering the, the bill. We broke the filibuster. It, it was another remarkable moment. Uh, as the law went on, I think you all know that ADAPT, um, which had been founded by a great guy named Wade Blank, um, tough guy, who, he was a nursing home worker. He saw all the abuses in the nursing homes and organized people in Denver to get uh, lifts on buses in Denver. Um, the Chicago ADAPT was formed. Uh, Chicago, as I mentioned earlier, brought litigation to get lifts on buses in Chicago. So ADAPT and Nickel were kind of working the ADA sort of simultaneously. ADAPT um, uh, went to Atlanta. Um, we were trying to get the lift on bus provision in the bill. Bill Lipinski was a congressman from Illinois at the time. He chaired the Surface Transportation Committee and um, was ticked off at how much money Chicago spent fighting the litigation. So we played an important part in laying the groundwork for the lift on bus provision. But in Atlanta, ADAPT was having one of their big demonstrations. We couldn't get the transit piece fixed. Um, remember Boyden Gray and Evan Kemp? Well, Boyden's now White House counsel. And we're in this big GSA building in Atlanta, taking over the building, and the cops come and they throw everybody out. And unlike other parts of the country where we'd had demonstrations where it had been peaceful, 
the cops in Atlanta were militant. They were throwing people out of their chairs. People were bleeding. And I, it was, you know, I had been to a lot of ADAPT demonstrations before, but I'd never seen anything like this. So I went over to the payphone, payphone, right, um, and picked up the phone and called my friend Evan and said, Evan, you've got to stop this. Isn't there something you can do? Evan said, call Boyden. I said, it's 7 o'clock at night. He said, here's his home number. Call him. So I called Boyden. Mind you, they're emptying out. They've arrested Wade Blank and a bunch of people. The cops are yelling, and I'm one of the last people in the building, and the cop comes over to me. I called this phone number, and it's Boyden. He, he remembered me, and I'm talking to him, telling him what's going on. Policeman comes over and says, you, you got to get out of here. And I said, I'm on the phone with the White House. He goes, yeah, right. I said, no, really, I really am. So I handed the cop the, the telephone, and all of a sudden the cop goes, okay, sir, okay, okay, sir, yes, sir, okay, sir, hung up the phone. He goes out and calls the um, head of GSA in the region, and the next thing they know, they come and they open the doors, and all the adapters are allowed back in the building, and we stayed up and had Chinese food for 100. That, that's one of my favorite memories. Okay, you'd think that would have been enough to get it through. It wasn't. So shortly thereafter, we're back in D.C., and two things happened, sort of back to back. Uh, the first was Nickel was in town. It's in May prior to the law uh, being passed, April or May. And we, we can't get the Bush. We want um, Lowell White I'm sorry, we want Dick Thornburg, who was the Attorney General, to testify and carry the Bush administration's okay. Like, if you, if you give us this bill, we'll sign it. And that was a critical message to get over there at the time, but we couldn't get it done. So uh, we tried everything we knew, and so once again, Pat Wright calls me up and says, we got to do something. So. I canceled our conference. Everybody's there. All the presenters are there to give their little talks and said, we're canceling the conference for the afternoon. We're going to have a march. And so we marched from the um, hotel to the Capitol. It was supposed to be a candlelight vigil, but it started raining. So we said, we're going anyway. We all took trash bags. We raided the hotel's trash bag collection and marched over to the Congress. And then we got over to the White House march to the White House, and now you're at the end of the rally, right? And I'm like, okay, I've never done something like this before, but I remembered, you know, don't lose your troops. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, how do you end this? How do you wrap up this day? I'd had no exit strategy, you know? So I did a little bit of street theater, and I picked up the telephone at the guard's desk and said, I'd like to speak to the president. And the crowd goes, ah! And, and they put me on hold. And I'm like, oh my God, they put me on hold in the crowds roaring. Another post person comes back and says, who is this? And I told him who I is. Puts me on hold again, and the crowd yells again. <laughs> Third time, and now this has all taken place over like 10 or 12 minutes. Um, the last time, it's a male voice. The first time were female voices. A male voice comes on and goes, okay, eight of you can meet at 9.30 in the Roosevelt tomorrow morning clear the grounds right now. So I turned around and told the group, and they went crazy. So the security guard comes over to me, and he says, well, who are you? <laughs> and I, he said, um, I've only seen a demonstration in my 12 years get in action once, and it was when the air traffic controllers went on strike. Um, so the next day, uh, eight of us, including Pat Wright and Evan Kemp, and who's in the meeting, Boyd and Gray, and the head of the Domestic Policy Council. Um, so we're, we're in the meeting the ver that next day, and we're talking about why we need this bill. When I got back to the room the night before, after this incredible demonstration, that was the first moment I felt like a leader, honestly, uh, first moment. I came into the hotel. We were in Bethesda, and it had this big uh, atrium, right? And as I came in, all my colleagues were already in the hotel all over the place, and they all started clapping. And I felt, you know, it was, it was a moment in my own career where I felt like um, I had made a difference. And 
my friends had made the difference, not me, but we. And um, so the next, that night, my husband called me. My son was about one year old, and my husband called and said, you're not going to believe this, but they just ripped up the play lot that we take Sam to and replaced it with a totally inaccessible play, play lot. And so now I'm in the White House meeting, and this domestic policy advisor is saying all the reasons why we can't do this and this is unreasonable. This is where I told you I was going to swear. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking of my son, and I'm thinking of the play lot, and I'm thinking, this isn't right. And I went, this is bullshit, just like that. And the room went dead silent. And for that minute, I realized, I guess you're not supposed to swear in the Roosevelt room. <laughs> However, um, Boyd and Gray leans over to Evan Kemp, and they whisper for a little while. The domestic policy advisor walks out of the room, just leaves. And Boyden says to us, I want to thank you all for coming here today. This has been very helpful. OK, so the first log jam is broken. We've now heard that they're going to allow Thornburg to testify. That was a big moment. However, we still haven't gotten the agreement we need. So a little bit after this, I can't tell you how many weeks, but not very much, ADAPT comes to town. And ADAPT um, is always full of surprises. And ADAPT calls up Senator Harkin, who um, it, there's a whole story about him to begin with, but ADAPT calls up Senator Harkin and says to, to Tom, I uh, hope you watch the news tonight. For those of you who have seen Lives Worth Living, the documentary, you'll remember this story. He goes, hope you watch the news tonight. We've got a little present for you. And Harkin goes, oh my God, what's ADAPT up to now? Well, that day, ADAPT had gone to Capitol. And this is before 9-11, so you could actually walk up the steps of the Capitol. And all, many, many, many of the adapters got out of their wheelchairs and climbed up the steps to the Capitol to demonstrate the point of how inaccessible our world was. All the major TV outlets were there, the national news, the front page of the Washington Post, and that was the watershed moment. Um, so I, you know, the rest is history. Um, I was giving birth to my uh, second child. Maddie was born on July 16, and I was two and a half hours post-delivery when my phone rang, and it was Justin. And he said, um, we've just set the date for the signing ceremony. Will you come? And I said, you bet I'll come. So I made my airplane reservation from my post-op bed. <laughs> Okay, six, ten days later, I was like, what was I thinking? No, I'm not getting on an airplane with a, you know, eight-day-old baby. And um, ended up celebrating it here with uh, Mayor Daley, who had just been elected mayor, and who, organized, because he had a disabled child himself, understood the significance of this and held our own uh, ADA celebration here in Chicago. I think the only other one around the country. Um, so, my gosh, all that is a little bit about, you know, what happened. But I want to say a little bit about um, the people who made it happen and why it was so important. Um, you've heard me talk about folks. You've heard me talk about what it was like in the pre-ADA period. Um, but I haven't really talked too personally about the people and the significance of their contribution. So I want to do that as I close up and then take your questions. Um, I want to talk really quickly about Ed, Judy, Ray, and Tony. Um, it, could, it could have been any other, any and Evan, could have been any number of other people. Ed, the guy who uh, went to, wanted to go to Berkeley, he had, was post-polio, used one of the first sip and puff wheelchairs, could only turn his head and move one finger, um, lived on an iron lung at night, uh, applied to UC Berkeley, was told by his college counselors he, sh he needed to go to Champaign-Urbana because that's where disabled people like him went. He said, no, I want to go to Berkeley. He applied, got in, 
showed up on campus without them knowing he was disabled. And they said to Ed, you have to live in the infirmary. And Ed said, no, I'm not sick. And that began the paradigm shift, the shift away from the medical model. Ed went on to transform that campus to later be told when he went to the state's vocational rehab agency and he wanted to get a job that he was too severely disabled to work and they closed his case and Ed said no I don't think so and organized the first center for independent living in order to take on the state's VR system and allow people like him to be able to be served. Um, Judy. Judy um, was, uh, had polio when she was little. Um, she was denied schooling. Her mom homeschooled her until the end of her third grade year. I think it was third grade. And her mom finally said, this isn't right. And her mom went to war with the school in New York City to let her get to school. She won the right to do that. Fast forward, Judy goes on to college. Judy gets her master's degree in special ed and goes back to New York where she wants to be a special ed teacher. I forgot to tell you why they told her when she was a little girl that she couldn't go to school. Remember this? Because she would be an insurance risk. So fast forward, she's now got her master's degree. Count the years, kindergarten to master's degree. She goes back and applies for a job to be a special ed teacher and guess what they tell her? No, nope, you'll be an insurance risk. Um, Ray, um, one, a very dear friend of mine with a psychiatric disability who spent 12 years living in a nursing home, nonverbal. She did not speak for 12 years until one day the nurse came to give her the meds that were ruining her life. And she said no. She, just like Ed had said no. She said no to the medical model and clawed herself out of that institution. Or Evan, who graduated, um, he had muscular dystrophy, went to college, graduated top in his class, editor of his law school journal, uh, valedictorian, applied to all the major law firms. All of his friends who were less qualified than him got job offers right away. The minute they saw his wheelchair, they shut down on him. He got no offers whatsoever. And Tony, Tony who had epilepsy, who wanted to be a Catholic priest. He did not know he had epilepsy. His parents had never told him. He did not know why he was having uh, these fits, as they were called, until he applied to become, or he got into the seminary, the Catholic seminary. He showed up. Um, when they did all his pre-med testing, they discovered that he'd been taking anti-epileptic medications and they threw him out of the seminary because in the Catholic Church at that time, you were deemed to be possessed by the devil if you were having seizures, which is why his parents had never told him he was an epileptic because in their words, no son of ours is going to have epilepsy. Tony didn't speak to his parents for 20 years, 20 years. So that's what it felt like. That's the experience we had. That's the experience we had. But I'm here to tell you that because those people found their voice and made it their business to change the paradigm, to borrow from the pioneers in the movements that preceded us, the civil rights paradigm. Those people went on to change the world, but they also went on to change things for themselves. Ed, the one who had been rejected as the too severely disabled to work, was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown to be the director of the same agency that told him he was too severely disabled to work. From that agency, he started the first home and community-based service program from which all the others have been patterned around the United States, paving way for our Olmstead cases. Judy, the person who was told 
that she was to, um, couldn't go to school because she was insurance risk, was later appointed by uh, President Clinton to be the Assistant Secretary for Special Education and Rehab Services, the highest official overseeing all special ed. She currently sits as the Special Advisor to the Secretary of State, advising um, the State Department and countries all around the world on how to promulgate concepts of inclusion through foreign assistance and uh, through legislative reform. Evan, the person who was told, who, who couldn't get a job after being top in his class, was appointed by President Bush to be the first disabled person to chair the EEOC, the top entity that said you can't discriminate in the area of employment. And Ray, my good friend Ray, who was the first person with a psychiatric disability to be appointed by a president and confirmed by the Senate to uh, serve on the National Council on Disability, who paved the way for the current movement of psychiatric survivors to challenge things as forced, such as forced electroshock therapy, forced institutionalization, and finally Tony, the person who was told he couldn't be a priest was the same Tony who brought forth the original ADA, Congressman Tony Coelho, and who recently, isn't this interesting? I've been working with Tony on the uh, uh, ratification of the disability treaty, so we have gotten to be very, very good friends over the years. And only in the last couple of months, as we've been trying to get the Vatican to say something nice about the disability treaty, did Tony share with me that a prior pope gave him audience several years later, and he was able to go and tell him about this archaic prohibition, and they changed it. So, you know, all politics are local, all politics are personal. One person can change the world. It's all of our responsibility to do that. And finally, the ADA was a victory legally. All of you who are in law, you wouldn't be here if we didn't have this. Um, but it was also a symbolic victory for our community because if you haven't read the preamble, this is your homework assignment, you have to go read the preamble to the ADA. The preamble lays out the legacy of discrimination and the new policy, the new paradigm, the new understanding it says in federal law that disability is a normal part of the human condition. Those are pretty much the words. And then it goes on in so many beautiful ways to say how the world has to change a little to let us in, to fit that new paradigm. And as, as I want to wrap up here, leave you time for questions, um, right after the ADA was passed, um, those people who had been working on um, the 504 uh, sit-in um, were reflective of the victory that they had all that many years ago and the hopes that they had for 504. And Tim Cook, who was an attorney, um, worked with at Pilcop and did a lot of the very early disability rights stuff, right before he died, wrote a wonderful article, Barry, you should get this one, it was in the Temple Law Review. And um, he wrote it in 1992. And he basically um, put a call to action out to us. And in the introduction he said, those of us who were there for the 504 demonstrations, watched all the celebrations of the ADA, the largest gathering on the South Lawn in American history still, there were 2,000 of us there, um, and, and remembered reflectively on the same feelings we had when 504 was passed. But 504 never was realized. It's, as he said, it fell into the uh, hollows of non-enforcement. That only if you enforce the law root and branch will you see real change? And he called upon us in the community to make it our business to hold our government, our lawyers, 
ourselves accountable for enforcing the law. Civil, laws, civil rights laws do not self-enforce without an informed and engaged citizenry. Um, that was my challenge when I became the chair of the National Council on Disability. I was the first chair after the law was passed. And what I set about to do was to issue reports um, that well, I set about to organize people with disabilities, to make them understand how important they were, to fight what I expected to be a backlash, um, enlightened, the person who enlightened me to that was another feminist. A book came out also in 1991-92 by Susan Faludi called Backlash. That's your second homework assignment. Read the introduction of the book called Backlash. She talks about all the different ways the backlash takes hold. And one of them was to uh, recreate old myths as new facts. Or that the, the, the um, opposition will come out in full force and you have to be ready for it. Well, that's what happened right after I became chair of NCD, 92, 93, 94. An organized backlash through the Heritage Foundation, uh, and a whole bunch of other uh, right-wing organizations started an effort to trash the ADA. Uh, there was a book called The Death of Common Sense that was written, and the ADA was the primary feature. And there was new legislation passed called the Unfunded Mandates Act. And we got hold of this through a, an intern that was working for me at NCD at the time who had come over from the hill. And he brought it to our attention and we went, oh boy, here we go, the deregulation task force in a new form. So we quietly and very quickly organized the civil rights movement to get to all the key leaders who had worked with us on the ADA and said, we need an exclusion for civil rights laws. The right didn't even know we did it until it was done. So. We have to remain vigilant. These laws um, aren't assured to be there forever. We have seen assaults through the courts, uh, the Sutton Trilogy, for example. We've seen uh, Kirk, uh, Clint Eastwood come forward. Uh, he owned a hotel in, Washington, in California that didn't have accessible bathrooms in all parts of the resort, and this woman tried to uh, make it accessible. Over a two-year period, she wrote him all these letters. She finally brought an ADA complaint. Clint Eastwood testified before Congress, lied, lied. I was sitting next to the PNA lawyer who had the file with him. And uh, Clint Eastwood got up with all the TV cameras and said how um, th this was when they were trying to do something called the ADA Notification Act that would require you to give advance notice before you sue somebody so they can have a chance to fix things. And he claimed that he had never, excuse me, been given any notice. The lawyer sitting next to me had the certified letters that had been returned with his signature unopened. So we can't be, uh, we can't take these things for granted. And that's where you all come in. You play such an important role uh, for those of you who are studying the law, um, partner with those of us in the disability community. I think Barry and John and others will say that's where the magic happens. When you get really great lawyers, such as the lawyers here or at Access Living, coupled with real life people who understand this as more than their own personal issue, we can get so far. And if we don't, um, we, can, we can be um, counting the days before somebody will be back to take apart the victories that we've won. I've learned that firsthand in our efforts to get the disability treaty passed. Um, we have now worked on the ratification effort twice as long as it took us to get the ADA passed. And ratifying the disability treaty requires nothing Zip, zero. Uh, 
except a vote in 57 senators. And because of an apparatus of lies and an echo chamber that has perpetuated those lies about the treaty, we have not been able to get it done yet. But we're not giving up. Uh, we're right now hard at work um, lining up votes and expect that um, we'll see a markup over the next couple of weeks. And with all of your help, and I have to acknowledge our own Senator Kirk's um, leadership role in trying to help get those um, amendments organized, hopefully we will see that America, who had led the world with the ADA, will now rejoin the world in embracing at the global level the important principles that the ADA brought us in the first place. So that's, I talked longer than I was going to, but that's what I have to say. Thank you. We have some time for questions. I do have one on mine that kind of follows up with what Mark was just saying, and it said, you know, they talked about how you haven't acted around the treaty, and the question is, um, why is this an important uh, issue for you, and why do you think it's important for America? Okay, um, why it's an important issue to me is I have traveled the world a lot. I have seen the conditions that one billion people with disabilities live in. Um, something like 1% of the world's disabled population, maybe 2% are literate. Um, people with disabilities live in poverty. They um, don't reap the benefit of many of the poverty eradication programs. Um, and in many countries, there are no laws yet that not only prohibit discrimination, but which support things like basic rehabilitation even. So the first and foremost, I believe that the Disability Treaty is the hope for those one billion people. Secondly, um, as a leader in this country who has worked with my peers all around the country, I mean all around the world, uh, we worked on this treaty together in the same way that our community here made the ADA happen. It's leaders with disabilities all around the world that made the treaty happen. And unfortunately, even though it happened in New York City, um, the United States was, well, was very underrepresented. Um, at the time, the, it, the sitting administration did not believe we needed a treaty because the ADA already existed. Um, so I've always felt a little ashamed that our both activist community and government hadn't played a more vocal role than it did, at least in the early phases of the treaty's evolution. So I feel a sense of responsibility to my peers. Um, finally, the, the law stands to make improvements for Americans with disabilities, veterans with disabilities, and all of our family members who want to travel, study, work, or serve in the military abroad. I can't begin to tell you the number of stories we've received of students who had to change their major because they couldn't go on the foreign exchange program that was a requirement for the major they were in, or military families not being able to accept a promotion and be uh, deployed in a particular country because the school system would not have served their child with autism, or you know, lots of these kind of circumstances. So it really does impact us, um, maybe not in the same way as it impacts others, but those are the reasons why I think it's so important. We belong there. We led the world. Uh, there are other practical issues. If you're not a ratifying country, by the way, there's something like 148 countries or more that have now ratified. We're amongst the only that haven't. And if you are a ratifying country, you're allowed to uh, have a rep uh, uh, nominate and have someone from your country serve on the committee that is sort of um, laying out the interpretation of the treaty. And we have more experience than anybody else in the world. So that committee is lacking the input of our expertise. And also once a year, um, all of the countries come forward through something called a conference of states parties. Um, only ratified countries can speak. So we're, we, 
the U.S. has to sit on the sidelines. We can't speak in those meetings. So, uh, you know, it's to me, it's abominable that we haven't, and I believe very much that we need to. Questions people have? Oh, well, come on. Well, people are <laughs> contemplating it. I mean, one thing you alluded to, Marco, was just some of the lies that have been put out there about the treaty, and, and maybe you could let people know, for those who aren't familiar with the treaty, as far as you know, what sort of the other side is saying about it that is incorrect, and how we can maybe fight that. Okay. Well, first off, um, treaties are sort of aspirational. They, they don't give explicit direction on what you have to do, but they lay out uh, through a series of principles and through a series of guidelines what countries need to do to adopt, to comply with the treaty. Um, the opposition started, we didn't expect any opposition. And um, other than the generic opposition that all treaties face in America, which is, um, they, are they a threat to our sovereignty? Are they a threat to our federalist system of government? Or um, people who just don't like the UN? Or who just don't feel the U.S. should be told what to do by any outside forces? So those are sort of the garden variety opposition that you hear to every single treaty. We expected we would get those. And all treaties that have been ratified have dealt with them through amendments um, that are called reservations, understandings, and declarations. A reservation, for example, might say that uh, we reserve that we're a federalist society and therefore accept under existing constitutional law of division of state and federal authority. Uh, by signing this treaty, we are not changing our federalist um, system. Um, so that's what a reservation is. It's an exception to the otherwise obligations that you would. Um, so we expected we'd go through a process and those would be the things that we would deal with. We expected that there might be some who tried to stretch elements of the treaty, but we never expected where the argument would come from. It started with a homeschool organization called the Homeschool Legal Defense Association and a gentleman by the name of Michael Ferris who started um, saying that the treaty will prevent homeschool families from homeschooling their children. That is not true. Uh, in fact, <laughs> you know, IDEA and other uh, American law and principles that are embodied in the treaty actually give the authority to be able to homeschool your child. But um, the homes, so you might say, well, why are they doing this? Well, they, they are opposed to another treaty, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, for all those same reasons. And they're, therefore, they have lodged this uh, pretty well-funded uh, campaign. They are, then, and they brought uh, Rick Santorum, who is a homeschool advocate and who has a disabled child, into their fold, and the Heritage Foundation, who prior to the homeschoolers starting to fuel this, had a pretty moderate position. They raised all the garden variety arguments in their early analysis, and even acknowledged that with appropriate reservations, understandings, and declarations, you could deal with it. Um, that triggered other um, elements of the more conservative part of our country to similarly go looking at the treaty to find fault. So there is a section in the treaty under um, uh, non-discrimination in the healthcare area that talks about uh, sexual and reproductive health, that women with disabilities um, have to be given, or people with disabilities have the same right to reproductive and sexual health as non-disabled. So all it is is a non-discrimination treaty. But a lot of folks have interpreted that to say it's going to be an open door to abortion. And um, if you were in the treaty negotiating sessions, um, it was made clear that the treaty does not address abortion. Um, it's neutral completely. So in a country that does allow abortion, you simply can't discriminate against women with disabilities and not provide that to them. But also, it protects women with disabilities from being singled out 
to be required to have abortions. Um, and it's very strong on family values, but their um, pretty well-funded, well-orchestrated campaign, um, it coupled with the, their ability to give, um, to use their network of kids, um, it has really given us a run for our money. Hi, I'm Joyce, and I'm an intern here, and I wanted to thank you so much for coming to speak. It's been fantastic. But you spoke early on about how there is a distinction between the civil rights um, movement and the disability rights movement, how there's like a beautiful moment, I think, with the Fair Housing Act where you guys were able to amend some of the protections given. And I was just interested to know, with people of color with disabilities, was there conflict early on with who they were going to participate with? Were they more active in the civil rights movement? Or was there any question. tension early on? Yes. The question, um, the question is, uh, given that there were uh, positive moments where the civil and disability rights movements worked together, uh, what about persons of color with disabilities and how have the two movements and individuals within it um, worked? Have there been moments of tension? Um, it's a complicated question with many different ways I can answer it. Let me try to bring it, uh, make it simple. People of color within the disability rights movement to continue to this day um, are underrepresented in leadership in the disability rights movement. People with disabilities who are of color feel left out of and underrepresented in the traditional civil rights organizations. Um, when I was chair of NCD, we hosted the first White House Roundtable on Race and Disability. And um, there, there was an incredible coming together at that time. Uh, Dorothy Height, one of the leaders in the civil rights movement, by then was using a, a wheelchair. And I'll never forget her. She was probably 85 at that time. And you know, one of these icons, she very quietly at the front of the room said, this is the first time all of myself are represented in one meeting. She, female, black woman, and person with a disability. So without a doubt, the issue is um, filled with conflict and tension. Um, organizationally, uh, it depends on the issue, how well groups are working together. To me, it's insufficient. And there are nuances. There are definite nuances. Um, you know, if you drill down into any policy issue, you're going to see a difference between races um, in how uh, issues, indications of poverty, educational status, et cetera. I will say that the issue came to a head recently w during the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Um, there was a big event happening down in Texas at the Bush Library, and the people down there had organized this big um, event. And it was a three-day event. Uh, all three uh, rem uh, living presidents were going to be there. It was a big deal. And we were the only group left out, only group. Uh, you know, gays and lesbians were there, persons, uh, you know, Latinos, uh, the labor movement, you name it, but we weren't. And so um, ADAPT led the effort to really make a big stink about this and um, were able, through the assistance of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and Senator Harkin, were able to get last minute changes to the program. So Lex, the gentleman I referred to, um, was able to be uh, a panelist on one of the programs. But it stung, right? It stung that this many years later, uh, we're still the postscript, you know, we're still the postscript. So I, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question. It would take hours and a whole other session, which maybe you should do. Sure. Um, <laughs> Thank you. No. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Mark, did you have a question? Yeah, Mark, I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts about, uh, picking up on your statement about all politics being local, on whether you had any particular perspectives about what's going on in Illinois and what might be, especially in a comparative context, like we've, I've heard a lot about Illinois being at the bottom of the list and maybe, you know, in terms of states that are being inclusive, 
Okay. Yeah, so you're talking on the policy rather than the movement side of yeah, things? Yeah, I'm talking about the policy. I mean, the yeah. movement wants to affect policy, and policy always ends up in okay. strange forms. Well, but. let me say that, um, first off, on the movement side, I feel really fortunate to be in Illinois because I feel like we have strong leaders here, um, and people pretty much play in the sandbox pretty well together. You don't see that everywhere. You see a lot of infighting, and we, you know, we uh, now and then you'll see it, but for the most part, I feel like the there's a pretty cohesive group across different disability types who have a similar philosophy now. But because we've lived in a medical model for so long, um, and because we're in a Midwest unionized state, there are challenges that we've had here that you see the lingering effects of. There was a very strong, well-organized professionalization of disability and unionization of the workers who serve. And that has made it challenging over 20 years for us to make incremental progress. Therefore, other states were making changes experimenting with new things, especially in the home and community-based service area, all along the way, and we weren't. And I think that's why our home and community, our, our institutional rate is so high. Um, and I will say nationally, you will see the same tension when you try to make change. You're still going to get pushback from the minority of family members who like the institutional settings. You're going to see that all over the place. What's a little different here is because we're in a very strong uh, union state, we've faced some resistance from one union. Uh, the flip side is also true. In the home and community-based service, that, that relationship with the union that has organized there has made our state stronger. Um, we have higher wages than a lot of the other home and community-based programs do and we work together with our union. As we sit here today, probably tomorrow, very soon, another big Supreme Court decision, Harris v. Quinn, is going to be announced that may, sh may tell the future of labor organizing in this space. So I guess I would say it's hard to do a comparison if you look at everything. Cause, but on the home and community-based thing, we're way behind. Um, schools? Um, similarly, um, the Chicago public schools, oh my God, we could talk forever on what a disaster that is. Um, it's hard to disassemble uh, um, poverty, race, uh, and all these other factors in this city that contribute to, to all this. They're so intertwined. But what I do feel really hopeful about is the, is the, the strength of our movement here. I think we've got a long way to go, though, in developing the next generation. Um, you know, that's something that weighs heavily on us at Access Living right now, is um, how do we find the leaders and groom the leaders and, uh, you know, succession plan and pass the baton and um, make sure that we have a strong group of people coming up behind us. Because the kids that we see now, are of the post-ADA era. They didn't live through this stuff. They didn't have to fight for it. They've kind of taken some of it for granted. And good for them on some level that they're off doing their thing. But somebody's got to carry this torch. Um, you know, we don't have, because disability isn't always uh, genetic, um, we don't have that intergenerational transfer that mothers have with their <laughs> girls or African-American fathers have with their sons. Um, we can skip multiple generations and not have disabilities. So we've got to go find those children and harness their energy and make sure we have a vibrant movement. On that note, I'd like to thank Marcus so much.